today, right now, we have the last panel. It is the last but not least panel, and it will be a very interesting one that tries to sum up various strands of thinking regarding the political issues in the Middle East, cooperation with the, with, uh, with the EU, uh, the way in which reform and uh, growth can take place also from a youth perspective. And we have a very interesting lineup of guests this evening. But first, I would like to, if possible, present just some short ideas on this topic for myself using my privilege as moderator to first introduce my ideas into the mix. So next slide, please. So regarding... EU and MENA cooperation. I think this is, I think this topic is of course of great interest, but there is an overemphasis placed on informal cooperation, which is of course important. For instance, cultural versus values diffusion, uh, the issues of models, the issues of elite formation and return. But I think that in the future, uh, the most important part of this cooperation will be the formal cooperation, including the uh, involvement of the EU in critical in infrastructure development, the establishment of uh, more balanced economic relationships based on win-win cooperation. This is, of course, a term that I took from our Chinese colleagues. And the fixing of various structural imbalances related to the economic relations between the EU and this region. Structural imbalances including, for instance, the, let's call it the stripping of high level human capital from the region and so on. And these issues are necessary in the long term to establish a better relationship. Next slide, please. All right, on youth. I think that the issues of youth are very sensitive because there is also uh, there is also a tendency to over-sentimentalize the issue of youth and to have, a, let's call it, a rose-tinted view on the issue. I think the young generation must be given the conditions in which it can become a factor of growth and stability rather than a liability for development in the region. Because if you see from this chart I prepared here, you have two issues. Right now we have very few countries that have healthy demographics and stable demographics. They are either in a demographic crunch, such as Europe and Eastern Asia, which leads to stagnation, aversion to risk and rigidity, or you have countries with youth bulges, Middle East, North, the Middle East, North Africa region, although the total fertility rates have been falling, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and so on. And here you need to invest in infrastructure, why? Because with infrastructure, you'll get a demographic dividend, you'll get growth, development, innovation, and dynamism in uh, entrepreneurship. But without the infrastructure, you will get radicalism, instability, and other issues that are associated with youth bulges. Next slide, please. So the preconditions for positive youth participation in the development of their countries are, and I try to be culturally unbiased here, value neutral, and to focus more on objective issues. Firstly, we already have a lot of the tools, digital tools, network building capacity, existing practices. But what the youth need are positive economic perspectives, depending on each country, some uh, meaningful levels of political participation, infrastructure that enables personal growth, a sense of ownership over their society, an expectation of intergenerational growth so that they will be better off than their parents, uh, economic growth rates that are consistently higher than population growth rates, macroeconomic stability, uh, affordable family formation, and lower economic variability. A lot of people focus on inequality in the region. But what also happens is that just like my own country, sometimes the, regions, the region grows very fast, and at the first sign of macroeconomic trouble, it also suffers economically very quickly. So you have a two steps forward, one step back kind of situation. Next slide, please. As for the political parties versus internet activism in the region, which was one of our topics, and it's the last topic that I will address, I think that we have to recognize that all of these have their own different sphere of activity. Political parties are focused on hierarchical mechanisms, on formalized participation, on structured decision making, they afford legitimacy and a full spectrum ideas. But internet activism cannot replace that because internet activism is about informal participation, a lack of hierarchies, 
uh, lack of consensus, a lack of enforcement, so they can never replace it. And expecting that movements born out of internet activism could uh, replace governmental decision making leads to inevitable reform failure. Next slide, please. From a book by Martin Guri, The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority, we, I, have some, uh, I have some quotes that were very interesting. He explained that the fundamental preconditions for the various protests, not just in the Middle East and North Africa region, but also from the West, for them to actually have a change, these preconditions were missing. Why? Because there is a crisis of authority, a revolt of the public, a negation of something rather than a positive construction, and the lack of political capital building. Next slide, please. The US public, like the public everywhere, is engaged in a long migration away from the structures of representative democracy to more sectarian arrangements. The public craves meaning and identity, and late modern society, including government, exists to frustrate this desire. And legitimacy exists objectively because vast numbers of the public agree subjectively that it does exist. If enough people change their minds, the authorizing magic is lost. So governments end up clinging more than they rule. So instead of ruling, they are clinging. Next slide, please. And this is the last one, I promise. Uh, yeah, that was the last one. Thank you very much. And now, with this short introduction out of the way, I would like to call on our first uh, panelist, Mr. Mahdi Rahimi from Iran, Executive Director Assistant of the uh, Iranian Association of Diplomacy. Please, sir, if you would like to take the podium or... Stay here All right. I have slides. Thank, you. Thank you very much. You have five to eight minutes. Could you please give me that stance? Yes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the MAPE and his Excellency Professor Sadat Meidani for inviting me to this prestigious and also fruitful forum as one of the youngest or maybe the youngest speaker, which is of course a great honor for me. Uh, I understand how exhausted and tired you are. So I'm trying to express my idea as soon as possible. I'm here today to talk about the dominance of the youth among the Middle Eastern population and their engagement in political format. Uh, let's start with uh, youth bulge in many region. To this end, we need to answer to this question. What is the population composition in the MENA region or how is the population composition in MENA region? As the statistics shows, nearly one in five people living in the Middle East and North Africa, Africa region is between the age 15 to 24, the age group defined as youth. Let's take a look at some statistics. Uh, I will skip these statistics and go to the last one due to saving time. As you can see here, for example, you can see number of children, adolescent and youth by country in 2015, 2030 and 2050 in millions. For example, you can see in 2050, Egypt uh, has 16 million uh, youth people. But the question, the main question here is, uh, what is the importance of the youth bulge in MENA region? To answer, the youth bulge possess opportunities as well as challenges for development. These opportunities is the so-called demographic bonus that follows uh, 15 to 25 years after the onset of fertility decline. However, this demographic bonus is not automatic and it depends on each country's social and economic policy responses to this kind of youth bulge. In uh, other words, in order to reap the benefits of this window of opportunity, many countries need to adopt the economic, 
social and political institution to change to changes brought by the unprecedented number of the young people as they move into the <coughs> adult excuse me for example they need uh, the educational system housing markets labor markets and health system must adapt to needs of young people and this needs uh, many efforts by the governments however uh, in the MENA region despite a wealth of oil resources and major improvement in health and education over the past few decades this region's political social and economic system have not evolved in a way that effectively meets the changing needs of this of its rapidly growing young uh, population Therefore, large youth bulge, bulges increase the risk of government collapsing and political instability breaking out. Responding to this perceived uh, political threat, governments may increase the political repression, as unfortunately we can see it in the MENA region in Middle East and North Africa. <clears throat> In the following, uh, I want to talk about uh, this topic, youth generation, double-edged sword, new needs and ideals. The changing uh, needs of youth in MENA are affected by what happens inside and outside the region. The globalization has brought a new dimension that profoundly affects the lives of young people in the region. And of course, uh, furthermore, we can say internet use is also growing fast and quickly, changing the lives of the youth and further widening the generation gap between young people and the old one and their parents, and more importantly, their decision makers and their governments. And it is in the context of large youth bulge that the Arab Spring occurred with those participating in protest being the youngest and also the most educated. While the Middle East and North Africa are rapidly maturing demographically, low economic and political opportunities for the youth in the region remain a major concern. Here I want to uh, share some results from an interesting statistical uh, research study by an institute in Norway, Peace Research Institute uh, in Norway, Oslo, about the Arab Spring. <clears throat> but uh, first, I want to uh, extract uh, three main points from this statistical research. First, youth bulge are associated with conflict and instability, but could be a major economic resource, as I mentioned. At, this, at, the, uh, at the start, start of, this of this presentation. presentation. Second, Second, the well-educated well youth, youth and, and the unemployed, unemployed people at large were more likely to take uh, part in the Arab Spring protests. And third, the democratic, demographic pressure is declining across the Middle East and North Africa, but major challenges, as some professors mentioned, uh, remain uh, in this region. For example, in this figure, you can see that uh, about here, about 40% of people between 18 to 20, 20 years old had participated in the Arab Spring. And you can see, uh, for example, the responded from Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, uh, Libya, and Yemen, which is very interesting. And another statistic shows that uh, more than here, more than 45% of students and about 30% of unemployed people have uh, participated in the Arab Spring demonstrations. <clears throat> but uh, here, the important question is, what are the youth in the MENA region seeking for? I have uh, participated the answer into two columns. Faith, uh, first, uh, challenges. They want a real, a practical uh, fighting with unemployment, corruption, hygiene rate, poverty, discrimination, and something like this. And they're seeking for new ideals, 
for example, such as democracy, sustainable development, peace and regional cooperation, rule of law, social and religious tolerance, transparency, and gender equality, as we can see in lots of research. So we have some index here that sh shows us the situation of these uh, index in our region. For example, youth male, youth male unemployment in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, and Syria, according to ILO and World Bank statistics, uh, Arab Spring started in 2010. You can see that in Yemen, for example, uh, in, sorry, in Tunisia, for example, 30% of male was unemployed, youth male, in fact, was unemployed on that period of time. Or, for example, you can see youth unemployment in Tunisia completely, um, I mean, men and women. Uh, you can see that according to ILO in Tunisia uh, in 2010, uh, about 30% of uh, youth people were unemployed. And here you can see the unemployment rate of female, which is very uh, higher than the male in, the, in our region. And there are other um, index, for example, corruption perception index, uh, which is an important index. We can we, uh, can clearly shows us governance quality in uh, in the MENA region. The CPI, the corruption perception index, from zero to ten, uh, one hundred is very clean country, and zero is highly corrupt. So you can see the MENA region. It's uh, in fact, a highly corrupt region in the world, unfortunately. So with an average score of 39 out of 100, uh, the Middle East and North Africa region is struggling to achieve tangible results in the, uh, in the fight against corruption. So uh, systematic political misconduct and private interests overtaking the common good have allowed the region which is already devastated by various conflicts to be ravaged by corruption and human rights abuses. And you can see the North Africa here, and we can compare our region with the other uh, region in the world, for example. You can see that Middle East is not in a good situation. But what is the future prospects? Although the demographic pressure is declining across the Middle East and North Africa, but major challenges remain, as I said before. So youth bulges have historically been associated with times of political crisis, and recent area research find that the statistical risk of conflict is increased in countries with very young population. Therefore, a large pool of frustrated, unemployed young people therefore makes for fertile ground for rebel recruiters. Similarly, when a large group of youth aspiring to, to political position are excluded from participation in political process, they may engage in violent conflict in an attempt to force the government to democratize, as, you, as we saw in the Arab Spring and some other regions. Here you can see the Arab Spring map. <laughs> this map shows us that Arab Spring uh, couldn't be uh, successful very much. For example, in Tunisia, we have democracy, but in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, we have civil war, and in other countries, uh, we cannot see the tangible uh, outcome of these protests and, demo uh, and demonstrations. Although tangible social changes have occurred predominantly among the young generation in the MENA region, the social movement resulting from these changes have not yet been able to make significant changes in the poli policies of the political system of this region's government, as I said. However, if, if, this educated young generation can play a role in power structure in any way, whether it is a revolution, as we saw in the Arab Spring, political reforms or democratic processes, for example, election, 
it can be hoped that one of the desirable ideals of this generation, which is the end of the war and regional conflicts and the formation of economic and uh, political convergence will come to the fore in, in, in the future. This conclusion will be more acceptable when we assume that the state's development depends on reducing tension in foreign relations and resolving disputes peacefully, especially with the neighbors. So it's my premise, in fact, and some research can prove this. But there are still some questions that I want to pay your attention to them. First, are all these conflicts relating to the birthing pain of democracy in the MENO region? Is it exactly like this? Second, will our region witness other political movement led, led by the youth in the future? And third, will internal political changes lead to the expansion of peace, reducing conflicts and resolving disputes in the MENO region? Thanks for your kind attention. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much for that interesting and in-depth look at various uh, factors associated with youth demographics and perceptions in the Middle East North Africa region and uh, positively outlining very well the challenges faced there. Now I would like to give the floor online, of course, to Ms. Shanzai Wasim, from, uh, originally from Pakistan, but speaking to us from Princeton University, New Jersey, USA. Please, are you online? Uh, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Absolutely. So you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is obviously Shanze, and whilst I live in the US, I've also lived in Saudi Arabia, the UK, and Pakistan. So I have quite a plethora of experience with the region. And so what I want to talk about today is track through diplomacy, but in terms of the youth. So one thing to understand is that track through diplomacy is one of the routes we should be looking towards. Why? Let's take an example of Palestine. So the Palestinians believe that current diplomats are not in favor of what they need. This can be seen from the Oslo Accords of 1993. Before that, Israel did not even recognize the Palestinian Authority. And so this only occurred at the 1993 conference. What would happen before is that the Palestinians would send their own delegation representatives, such as at the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991, as those people could understand the problems they were facing. So the PLO, the PA before that, did not operate within that country. And so they could not advocate properly for what was desired and what was needed. But because the people who actually lived within that state understood the problems, they were able to represent the needs properly, which created a huge problem. Why? Because Israel was not able to garner what they wanted from this. And so what they did is they turned 180 degrees, sidelined the youth, sidelined this delegation, and gave power back to the PLO and the PA. So the question then remains, Israel got what they wanted, which was a denationalized Palestinian entity to assume local governance. So how do we change things? How do we bring about our own power back? Well, that's with the youth and the youth getting involved in this conversation, representing their own interests without the confines of a government that is self-benefiting. So track to diplomacy is the means to promote interna internal reconciliation. Now, why is jumping into the conversation important? Let's take a look at the Trump peace plan of 2020. So whilst a peace plan was proposed, Palestine was not even at the table. And so everything that was within that understanding did not benefit them. So it becomes clear that someone is needed in this conversation, but who? We've tried track one with the senior most politicians. So who should we bring in? The youth. Now, why the youth? Well, the room for the youth is that we are the ones that are going to be inhibiting this world. We are the future leaders, we are the caretakers, and we are its protectors. 
we were raised in the environment and we are the ones that suffer the consequences. So lack of job security, lack of job prosperity, lack of healthcare, lack of education. And for us, there's a very deep understanding that this is a global village, that when one falls into disarray, we all fall. Take climate change as the prime example. Whilst the senior most profiteer and benefit, it is us that reap the negative consequences, having to take that into the future. So the difference between the youth is that we have a futuristic vision. We understand the effects because we are the ones that are going to have to suffer them in the long term. And so that is the answer of why the youth should be involved. But then the question arises of how do we involve them? If track one diplomacy didn't work, if bringing in these diplomats didn't work, how are we going to bring the youth onto the table? Well, to understand this, let's look at the revolution in Egypt in 2020. So the government was overthrown, but it did not use the traditional political party method. What they did use was a revolution that was completely organized online. So people using Facebook pages, online groups, social media, to be able to create the decentralized protests that targeted all your levels of government and your institutions. So looking more deeply, the longstanding tradition of using a political party to be able to control or to bring back order is very different in current day because there's a lot of legislation and red tape tied around it. Because it's existed for so long, we are able to prevent people. We are able to confine what can and can't be done in terms of rallying support and in terms of garnering that control back to the people. And so the youth cannot get involved within this because first of all, all of this legislation red tape exists. And second of all, the high barriers to entry. So to become a diplomat, to get at that table through track one requires not just expertise, which we do have, but experience and years of it. There is a long list of people at the table who have all that experience beneath their belt. And for us to fight that or to get involved is a lot more difficult. So where does the platform exist for the youth? Simply internet activism. Why? There are very low barriers to entry. It has a large platform and it's much easier to rally support by directly aiming at the masses. So now that we've understood who and how to bring them to the table, the question is why are they not already at the table? And that can simply be understood by the conference today. So quest for security and stability, the question of security. So within internet activism, as it's not existed for that long a period of time, there is very limited security in terms of how to protect these people. So tracking your IP address, surveilling your location, using your own data against you, your messages to your friends, your peers, your coworkers, your media files. All of this is right at people's control. And examples of how your information can be used against you and how you can be targeted can be seen from the death of Jamal Khashoggi. So we need to understand that track one is under the public eye. There is a scrutiny, which is why there is protection for these people. Track two is not. These back-ended meetings, this understanding of activism and doing it through different means, because it has not existed, there is not enough security for the people at the front line. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring about the security? We simply look towards those who are aiming to help them. So an example would be an NGO known as Guardian Project in the USA, a nonprofit that I personally work at, which works with human rights activists, which works with journalists, which works with NGOs. Now, what do they do? They provide secure apps, open source software libraries, and customized solutions to people such as your journalists. With what? For example, Circulo, an app that is used to control the problem of surveillance. So with surveillance, people can find you. They can track you, and that is how people disappear and get harmed. So what Circulo does is it shares your location with your trusted group using strong cryptography and using end-to-end -end encryption, people cannot see the data where you've been. There is no record kept of your past history, so no one can log in or hack you and see where you have been, who you have been meeting with. And it is constantly updating people about if you're in a secure zone or an unsafe zone. Another app known as Proof Mode 
keeps your information from being hacked using cryptography again. But what it does is it keeps your files away from others to be used against you, but it retains them in case you want to use them later on. An app like Convene is used to communicate with your people back home. So other members of your NGO, your group, your organization. Why Convene? Because there's no data kept, there's no profile login, there is no issue of someone taking in your information because no records are being kept. So what is important to understand is that there is a very large vacuum in terms of who can join this conversation because of the lacking security. So we've already tried track one, but that doesn't mean we need to take out track one diplomacy. It simply means we need to add on. Hand in hand comes track two diplomacy. But why is this the main focus? Because track two diplomacy is what can route track one. So what happens with your diplomats, your politicians, is that because of their age, because of the pressures upon them, because of the legislation and red tape, they're bound to certain confines. And that is why the information being made, the cores being made, the drafts being drawn up do not favor everyone. They favor those in power at that time. But the power is in masses as long as they band together. And so how that can be done is by taking track due to diplomacy and allowing that to route track one in its favor. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Shanze, for your presentation of the capacity of mobilizing the youth and of the tools that can be used today, the, the deployment of technology for this purpose. I'd like to invite our next, uh, next guest, Ms. Uh, Muscat Effendi, also from Princeton University, to join us for a five-minute speech. Are you there with us? Yes, yes, right here. Um, Assalamu alaikum, peace and blessings be upon you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I begin with the name of God, most blessed and most merciful. I'd like to start off by expressing gratitude to all in attendance for your time and attention, and especially to Mr. Flavius Kabal for inviting me to speak at today's conference. As a Pakistani American, a firm believer in Islam, and a youth activist myself, I take great pride in learning from both the greatest accomplishments and failures of history. I'm a student of public policy and international affairs at the number one ranked university in the United States, Princeton. Having studied historical political relations and patterns, today I want to focus on the role of youth in shaping the socioeconomic agendas of the international political community. A well-known and often cited figure in the Muslim community in Pakistan and in the, in the Middle East would be 16-year-old Mohammed bin Qasim, commander general, governor, and leader of the rise of the Islamic civilization. Born around 695 AD and being only in his early teen years when he was appointed the governor of Persia, his skill, his dedication, judgment, and passion for his people was astonishing. He was a military commander of the Umayyad Caliphate and led the Muslim conquest of Multan and Sindh from the last Hindu ruler, Raja Dahir. He was the first Muslim to capture Hindu regions successfully and started the early Muslim rule. While Mohammed bin Qasim is an example of a successful military conquest, it is not what I find commendable. It is instead the socio-political perspective that he brought with him to Hind and Sindh region, which I admire the most. While most of the natives of the region were primarily non-Muslims, his manner of ruling and his protection of native rights and property and non-coercive attitude in regards to religion was what led the natives of the region to admire him and even create statues of him that they would memorialize. More than 28% of the population of the Middle East is aged between 15 and 29 representing over 108 million young people. This is the largest number of young people to transition to adulthood in the region's history. I would like to point out that today's wars like Mohammed bin Qasim's are not about land and power and conquest. Today's wars are about resources. 
Today's wars are not isolated by the formal and defined borders of countries or unions. Today's wars are connected by today's medias and news outlets and are entirely connected and international. Today's youth is not oppressed by the boundary of nationalism, patriotism, or even regionalism. They're burdened by the weight of human rights violations. We are burdened by the lifespan of the planet we live in, by the oppression of our brothers and sisters in Yemen, in Palestine, in China, and around the world, by systemized poverty, racism, sexism, and ethnic marginalization. Today's wars are not the same as they were even a decade ago. It is more important now than ever that every individual representative sitting in the crowd today pauses to take initiative and create opportunities for the youth for engagement. If we want to create security in the MENA region, it begins with securing the youth from the grassroots level. It's about fixing education systems According to the Middle East Youth Initiative, the MENA region has the highest rate of youth unemployment in the world of any other region. Let's pause and look at an example of Greta Thunberg. A 15-year-old climate activist became famous after, you, after she protested outside the Swedish parliament in 2018. She held a sign saying, school strike for climate to pressure the government to meet carbon em emissions targets. A 15-year-old child's call to action had an awe-inspiring international effect. Thousands of young people organized their own strikes. By December 2018, more than 20,000 students from the UK to Japan had joined her by skipping school to protest. A year later, she received the first of three Nobel Peace Prize nominations for climate activism. This is an example of a child given the resources and opportunity to translate their passion into action. Yet for countries in political conflict like Yemen, it is a great misfortune of humanity that its people are dying either by direct conflict or in response to insufficient food, health and sustainable infrastructures. Of those dead, the UN reports 60% are children under the age of five years old. I'm not asking you to solve world hunger today or save the earth. I'm not asking you to stop the wars. What I am advocating for here is simple. I'm asking that each of us take responsibility to include the fate of the youth as a priority in the roles we play in our respective institutions and organizations. To create platforms like the one I have today, right now, to speak, to advocate, to change with sustainability at the forefront. I'm going to finish with a quote from the Quran addressing the youth and how God guides them who believe. This translates to, it is we who relate to you, O Muhammad, their story and truth. Indeed, they were youths who believed in their Lord and we increased them in guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Muscat, for that heartfelt plea for change driven by youth and their needs. Uh, I'd like to invite now Ms. Lokramiara Ivaz from Romania and Sweden associated with Lund University, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay, so, so um, Khair, and good, good evening. evening. I, I hope, hope you are not too tired or bored for some more minutes. minutes. Uh, because, because I'm, I'm um, starting, starting to address the, the elephant, elephant in the room, room, if you allow me to say so. And the, the elephant, elephant in this context being, of course, the question of Palestine. So, 
Okay. Uh, why am I saying that the elephant in the room? Well, because we cannot speak about the peace and conflict in the Middle East without addressing the Palestinian question. And in addressing this elephant, I'm happy to share with you the results of my latest study, which I did for completing my master's degree in um, Middle Eastern Studies at the University, um, as uh, Alexander was saying. So, so what, what I discussed for, for this thesis is, is what, what you see written on this slide up there. And, and I'm going to read the regional cooperation in the Middle, Middle East. Has the question, question of Palestine passed or not? And in other terms, I try to read from a neorealist perspective, uh, which are the opportunities and the challenges for regional cooperation in the MENA region around the Palestinian question. Now, being a young researcher, I speak from a better position than probably some of my uh, of the previous speakers, as I'm not involved in politics, so I can be more sincere probably. Um, one important disclaimer that I want to make before going on is that I, I, I won't speak about Palestine versus Israel. It's not a topic of my research. But I do speak about um, if there are opportunities for regional cooperation, if the other states of the MENA region can come together along the Palestinian people and build together some sort of alliance, uh, being it political uh, or at the social level, to advance the statehood agenda. Now, some words about the methodological stuff. I spoke to 20 uh, leading, leading Palestinian, Palestinian scholars, scholars so uh, most of them um, academic professors, and I also uh, consulted some existing statistical data on the Palestinian and Arab public opinion. The research uh, question that uh, guided my uh, inquiry sounded like this. To what extent do Palestinians, and by Palestinians, I mean both in the, the Palestinian intellectuals and the Palestinian people, Perceive, perceive the need for a regional ally in, in advance of the diplomatic, diplomatic dialogue of the Palestinian statehood. And um, of course, as I uh, already stated, I wanted to explore. Now, before going on, I must convey to you that I started actually from two assumptions, which some of you might still believe in because I did um, in the past. Uh, starting, starting from the readings that I've done, the discussions that I had with my uh, Middle Eastern peers, and so on. And those those assumptions, assumptions were that the Arab uh, people and the um, Islamic Muslims in the MENA region do believe and are um, do express solidarity towards the Palestinian question. That was one of the assumptions. And the other one was that Palestinians do perceive the need for uh, those allies. And I wanted to test them. And I should say from, uh, from this point that the results were rather contradictory to them. Um, and another, and another, another mention before that is that, that uh, I try to look uh, at the roles played by Saudi Arabia, Iran, and, and Turkey, which were perceived by me as regional leaders or emerging leaders of the region. Uh, further on, I want to structure the discussion around three main questions. Uh, these questions are why, how, and what. Of course, I'm not going to say why it is a conflict with Palestine, because we need to say at least one day uh, here. Uh, but I'm going to say why do we still need to talk about Palestine? Because while it's important to discuss about current crisis, um, such the one that is currently going on in Ukraine, it is as important to discuss about um, maybe the oldest uh, ongoing conflict in the world, which is the one um, regarding Palestine. Now, some numerical, I hope you can see them, some numerical and qualitative um, reasons, let's call them like that, uh, for why the question of Palestine has still, um, does still need to be addressed by the literature and by the policymakers and by us, people interested, interested in those affairs. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read them. them. I, I hope you can see them. But basically, it's, it's about the one state reality. reality. It's, it's about uh, continuing acts of violence. violence. As, As we, we speak, speak there are people um, who are suffering because of the current situation. 
also some regional and international tendencies and dimensions are not is not comprehensive because once again the word is too complex to summarize it in 10 minutes but uh, an, important, an important tendency at the international level is that we witness now an ongoing number of people especially at the civil society level that uh, express solidarity towards the question of palestine and towards the palestinian cause and it is this um, level uh, of the civil society that we will probably capitalize on in the in our future um, endeavors uh, regionally, um, as, as you can, can see on my slide, slide there, there is a process of repatterning of regional alliances, and in this regard, the Gulf monarchies are key actors. Um, and of course, the Abraham Accords of 2020 are a um, showcase in this regard. Moreover, there is an increasing role associated with Iran, with Turkey, and with Qatar, and I would also maybe add to this list the Emirates. There are the already known and discussed uh, conflicts and uh, political and economic uh, instabilities in the region. And because of all these reasons and some others, the question of Palestine uh, tends to appear of secondary importance. And this is exactly why we should continue to talk about it. Now, um, maybe this map uh, is familiar to you. If not, if not, I invite, I invite you to, to have, have a look at it. it. This is basically how the geographical and territorial um, aspect of Palestine and Israel has changed during uh, the uh, 70 years uh, history of conflict, uh, even more. Um, and what I thought of and how I um, started my, my research is to look at the change reality and also start to change the discourse to change the paradigm that we are using at the policy making at the academic level at this uh, kind of uh, setup environment that we are currently in to this end there are three key aspects or points that we have to discuss about the first one is whether or not the palestinian cause is a middle eastern one or not the second one to what extent the currently dominant state solution is it viable or not and finally what does uh, traditional trequan diplomacy so-called can do uh, currently or in the near future or in the later future for the uh, palestinian issue now i'm going to introduce you to the findings of my study of course it's a short summary because it was quite a complex one uh, i chose to structure them around four main um, topics the first one being the conceptualization and problematization of the issue. And in this regard, a growing literature and um, opinion, intellectual one, but not only, uh, started to define the problem of Palestine, not in terms of a conflict or a protracted conflict, but in terms of a settler colonial project. And this is an important aspect because we're gonna see when they propose um, further solutions, they came back to this type of um, conceptualization. Uh, further on, uh, a growing uh, list of um, articles, books, um, intellectual discussions are now uh, talking about the one state reality. We cannot, uh, to be honest, speak about two states because the other state is not a complete one. So, so what, what it is, is what, what we witness, witness as we speak, is a one-state reality. And um, all of the um, uh, intellectuals, academics, uh, scholars that I have been speaking to uh, for this research uh, agree that uh, we face a balance of uh, power issue. Uh, in terms of the changing of the change of the paradigm, uh, which is the two-state solution, I uh, chose to abbreviate it. Um, I understood it, I read it. And for those of you who are familiar with Foucault, with the regime of truth issue, which is helpful in some instances, in some um, regards, in some others, might, might not be. Uh, and uh, this regime of truth became uh, a uh, function for uh, both the Palestinian policy making, but also for the uh, policy makers of the region. 
some others uh, of course um, conceptualize it in terms of a new a new imperial project and we speak more about the internationalization of the Palestinian cause and I'm going to explain you why because nowadays it's not about pan-Islamism, pan-Arabism, about uh, regional solidarity, but it's about human rights, it's about national rights, it's about human security, uh, economic security, and so on and so forth. I'm going to talk about a bit, a bit later. Um, when looking at the broader regional map, there are two key aspects and factors, which I assess as being both converging and diverging. It depends on the perspective that we are looking from. And those factors are the US alliances in the region and the threat perception at the level of the regional government. I'm going to explain. Well, while the US alliances uh, in the region are growing, I'm not going to list the countries because I'm sure all of your most of you are aware which are those countries. In terms of threat perception, there is a key um, tendency that is going on now. And that tendency is uh, moving from uh, perceiving Israel as a um, source of threat in the region towards um, uh, associating this function with Iran. And that is changing the regional alliances. And that has also implications for how we discuss about diplomacy, regional, regional cooperation, regional integration, and the place that the, the question of Palestine occupies in this map. And um, of course, starting from these two factors, we can already look for or observe that there are some um, tendencies towards bipolarity in the region, with once again Iran and Israel as the two main poles. Um, as for the regional dimension, there are a lot of findings in this regard. I'm just going to um, uh, pinpoint the leading ones, one of which being the gap between the governments and the people. And this gap is, um, is present both in Palestine and in the regional countries. I'm going to uh, go a bit faster. And the prevalence of pragmatism, uh, pragmatism. No matter how much the people of the region sense and um, express solidarity towards what is happening with the Palestinians, in reality, the security and economic interest, uh, interests prevail. Um, in broader terms, uh, the way forward, as it was expressed uh, or as it uh, was concluded from the data that I collected, are that uh, there is limited potential associated with traditional diplomacy. We speak more and more about people-to-people -people diplomacy, exactly the um, topic of, uh, of this session. Um, we speak also about uh, an increased role associated with popular struggles for what one of my um, interviews named grassroots diplomacy. We talk about continued boycott, divestment, and sanctions um, on Israel or um, allied countries, and about one-state formula, and how can we translate this one-state formula into um, something that is, um, that, that is uh, assuring security for both peoples, both the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now, yeah, I'm not going to read this. There, there are some important, important theoretical and empirical implications for those of you who are interested to also address this issue from an academic point of view or from the policy making point of view. And this is the so what, the final one. And I'm going to let you read because I don't have time anymore. Um, this, uh, these results are going to be published soon, I hope. Uh, if not, uh, if you're interested in reading more, I'm happy to share them with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ivaz, for your very interesting presentation from a neorealist perspective on the issue of Palestine in the current context. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Kais Kafli from Syria, member of the Scientific Research Council of Al Sham Private University and member of the National Union of Syrian Students. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
dear excellencies, distinguished guests, good evening. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Flavius Capamaria, the president of uh, the Middle East Political and Economic Institute, and uh, Mr. Morishan, the president of your defense, for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this important panel. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here today in the presence of this number of respected ambassadors, elite professors, politicians, and economists. Only the best people in any field will take the time and make the sacrifice to come so far for a conference like ours. In fact, we have a huge task ahead of us today. When talking about the type of threats our region is facing and the role of the youth in the region and the impact of all conditions and circumstances on the peace process. We can sort the direct threats our area is facing into three types. The first is the traditional threats as the long lasting continuous Israeli aggressions and the occupation of Arab lands. And the ethnic cleansing crimes practiced on the Palestinian people and what it includes of provoking the feelings of all Arabs and all Muslims around the world. The second type of, uh, the second type of these threats is the internal conflicts our region is facing, which usually are driven by Western powers seeking to impose their will on the region and on the world. And the third new type of threats affecting the stability in the region is a set of urgent new issues on our society, which are poverty, migration, migration of youth, human trafficking, and drugs. All of these threats combined not only threaten our region, but constitute a great threat to the global peace and security. And this is what makes all peoples, states, organizations, and institutions stand before a major duty toward the future of the world in which we live. To find real solutions, solutions that touch the heart of the problems in the light of justice and the restoration of usurped rights. Here comes the importance of the track to diplomacy as an unconventional cross-border, transnational, not between governments, but between peoples, which may be one of the best methods actually to improve our external, external relations with other people and explain our suffering. But when talking about the track to diplomacy, we have two main obstacles that must be taken into consideration. The first one, that unfortunately, we in the MENA region, we have limited capabilities to work on the track to diplomacy. And we have different civilization and that will put obstacles with different culture and civilization that will put obstacles in communication between our peoples and other nations. The second and most important obstacle is that our most urgent and most dangerous issue in the Middle East is the issue with the so-called Israel. And using such kind of diplomacy between Israelis and us, it's very hard, if not impossible. It's because the Israelis are not willing to make, to compromise. They are not willing to make peace, to give Palestinians their rights, their motherland that they need as much as they need to live in peace. The Israelis are not willing to return the occupied Syrian Golan Heights. And this is what make, makes this kind of diplomacy impossible to be used between us and them. How to use it while many people in our region, so many people in our region, the majority of our population see Israelis as fanatical Zionist occupiers who kill children, women, and even journalists. Syria has tried to deal with this issue with several methods. First, Syria has entered the negotiations 
since 1991 during the Madrid peace process, although we have our land occupied since 1967. But Syria preferred the peace process. But if you are not able to restore our land in peace, Syria will find itself forced to use other methods to recover the land and the usurped right. Dear ladies and gentlemen, talking about all the aforementioned threats and problems, we must talk about our most effective tool. About 65 of the population of my country, the most dangerous group of the society, which if not given the opportunity to have a better future, will cause the whole world to force a greater dangerous and greater problems in the near future. In Syria, the war has been going on for more than 11 years. It's a war, it's not a spring, it's not a revolution, it's an international war on Syria. It's been going for 11 years now, and many of our youth, especially those who live in the areas fell under the oppression of the armed terrorist groups backed by the United States and Turkey and some other countries. Many of these youth didn't have the opportunity to enter schools and grew up in a society where the dominance is for women, where the lawlessness and the insecurity and the spread of drugs and the scenes of slaughtering, the scenes of slaughtering, slaughtering human beings and abusing their corpse are the main futures of the society. These young people, if they are not taken into account as soon as possible, if not rehabilitated, will, con will constitute a real problem for the security and stability, not for Syria, not for the region, but for the whole world. Today, we have got chances for improving the future of these youth. We have excellent communicating methods to reach for them through youth organizations, through social networks. But we all know that we have near to zero, to zero opportunities to do that or to make any real difference because of the unilateral coercive measures taken by the United States of America and the Western countries that walking behind her on their steps. Our youth are the dominant force of the grassroots and they are facing an inside struggle, an identity crisis in the time where the Western values and the Western culture makes our community feels a real danger on the Islamic and on the Arab, Arab identity. Okay. They feel real danger on the Islamic and on the Arabic, Arab identity from the new savage liberalism driven by the United States. As everybody knows, since 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, America has adopted a strategy based on imperial expansion vision to dominate the whole world. And this policy led to many wars around the world. And we have witnessed in our region the instability and the conflicts caused, caused by the United States and causing human sufferings and killing thousands of peoples and destroying many countries like Iraq and Yemen. All of that made the youth in our region feeling insecure and impassionate about building bridges with the Western communities. Here, we, uh, here and finally, we can put three ways to enroll our youth in the political solution if you are looking for one. Organize social media activities, efficient youth organizations, and political parties focused on the youth of that region. Youth, using these methods will give our youth a chance of participating in the building of their own future and trust me, the energy and the will owned by the youth, if invested, will accomplish nothing less than miracles. And thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Kafri, for your uh, very impassioned plea in favor of uh, true youth activism in Syria. I want now to introduce Mr. Vlad Adamescu, representing Romania and the United Kingdom, King's College London, for his uh, presentation. Five thank minutes. You. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Georgescu. Thank you, Mr. Kaba Maria, for your invitation. Thank you, Dr. Muneshan, distinguished guests. As uh, Mr. Rahimi stated at the beginning of this panel, uh, very well put, uh, the, Arab Springs the Arab Spring protests and revolutions, thank you, uh, were carried out overwhelmingly by young people. And coincidentally, we are now at a, at a moment in history where we are witnessing the end of that, ch of that chapter in North African history. And this is why I would like to focus your attention on the, on the current political situation in Tunisia. As you are all probably aware, Tunisia is undergoing some massive transformative constitutional changes. Yeah, okay. Then, oh, apologies, my apologies. I know we, we were all in a hurry, so that's why I wanted to do so. um, These constitu constitutional changes are set to culminate in just a few weeks when voters will approve or reject a new constitution. This new draft fundamental law has been criticized both internationally and domestically, as it is exclusively the product of President Kais, Sa Kai Kais Saeed's legal thinking. There have been no extensive consultations with citizens and interest groups, as was the case with the 2014 constitution. This new draft dramatically increases the power of the presidency at the expense of everyone else, placing him or her at the center of a kind of hyper presidential system. Given this, I'd like to talk about three main aspects, how we got to, here, to, to where we are now, namely the political events that have taken place over the past three years, to see if and why a new political regime has to be ordained. Then I want to examine a bit the 2014 constitution. Probably I won't do that because we are out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apologies. And finally, I'll conclude with some thoughts about what can be learned from the Tunisian experience in the wider MENA region. Tunisia currently has a semi-presidential system with a directly elected president who is supposed to share power with the legislature and the prime minister. Kais Said, a political outsider and an anti-establishment figure who used to be a law professor, won the 2019 elections with an overwhelming majority of 72% of the vote. Almost immediately after the election, Tunisia was very hard hit by the pandemic. It, ex it experienced a GDP contraction of 20% between 20 2019 and 2020. It was against this backdrop with the added issues of the persistent inequalities in Tunisia that last year on the 25th of July, President Said dismissed the prime minister and the government and then suspended parliament ruling by decree for the last year on the basis of a sui generis and blatantly unconstitutional interpretation of Article 80 of the fundamental law. One thing is clear, the institutional architecture established by the 2014 constitution did not withstand the exogenous shock of the pandemic and the crisis that followed. I will move now to the, so what we need to understand is that the 2014 constitution was the result of a, a huge political compromise between all the major political forces in Tunisia. And this compromise, was made possible by the electoral system uh, introduced by the transitional authorities in the aftermath of the 2011 revolution. The electoral formula that has been used for all three legislative elections that have taken place over the past three decades, over the past decade, so 2011, 2014, 2019, has been the hair quota largest remainder. This is a quote unquote perfect proportional representation system, perfect not because it is adequate, but because votes are very accurately transformed into seats in parliament. There is no threshold below which parties are excluded from gaining seats. This means that smaller parties are favored and can gain representation very easily. The system worked well for the first constituent assembly elections because it, it ensures that all interests are represented when drafting the fundamental law. And it allowed for the compromise that I described above. But this system should have been abandoned starting with the 2014 elections and electoral thresholds should have been introduced. Instead of strengthening democratization, this type of perfect proportional representation has led to political deadlock, stagnation and fragmentation. Any kind of major policy reform was dead before it could even be debated as the coalition that followed these elections 
contained so many opposing interests. What all parties could agree upon was dividing up government and other administrative offices to their own supporters in a clientelist system that is typical of transitioning democracies, but could, that could have nonetheless been avoided or at least ameliorated. Beyond its very, its very damaging effect on people's trust in democracy, fragmentation also led to the second issue that I'd like to address, namely the failure to set up a functional constitutional court. Such a court is fundamental. This cannot be stressed enough in a semi-presidential system, especially in a semi-presidential system such as Tunisia, which is prone to cohabitation, meaning that the president is from a party and the prime minister from another one. The court is supposed to adjudicate on conflicts between all three branches of government, strengthen democracy and the rule of law by checking and balancing the powers of these branches. So according to a 2015 law, the constitutional court's 12 members are appointed sequen sequentially, the first four by parliament with two first majority, then four more by the Superior Judicial Council, four more by the President of the Republic. What the point is that this, this procedure is very complicated and only the court could have found President Said's later actions to be unconstitutional and stop the backsliding process. But because these actions had to be taken sequentially, uh, there was no court. The court was never fully established. And this was a very bad thing for democracy in Tunisia. Pierre Vlad, one minute. Yeah. Thank you so much. The future of democracy in Tunisia is uncertain. Hopefully not all of the progress registered over the last decade will be lost. The Tunisian experience does set, up some, does set out some clear precedents that should be understood by other democratizing nations in the MENA region and also in the wider world. First, consensus politics, consensus politics in young democracies beyond the constitutional moment are very dangerous and should be avoided. Second, semi-presidential systems should only be established in conjunction with a powerful and independent constitutional court whose members have thorough legal training. The procedure used to elect the members of this court should be stra as straightforward as possible. And for example, the legislature will, could elect its portion of members through simple or absolute majorities. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for this description of political developments in an important North African country. And now I'd like to invite our last speaker, but not our least speaker, Ms. Isabella Zaidan from Syria, member of the Scientific Research Council, Al-Sham Private University, and member of the National Union of Syrian Students. You have the floor, five minutes, please. Please. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my thanks to Dr. Kaba Maria and Dr. Morishai for inviting me here, and to His Excellency, the Ambassador, the Syrian Ambassador, His Excellency, Dr. Walid Osman. Uh, I don't know where to start, actually. I have plenty of ideas. Five minutes, I, I don't think... Start with the juiciest parts. Okay, great. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Okay, uh, let's start with the idea that um, uh, I'm not here in the process of giving you any history lessons. Uh, it's just a gentle reminder. <coughs> uh, after invading Iraq in 2003, President George W. Bush has launched what is called the New Middle East on the tongue of his Minister of Foreign Affairs, Condoleezza Rice. Uh, the plan of uh, Bush at that time was to represent, Isra uh, to preserve Israel's security and integrated into a normal, uh, integrated into the Arab world as a normal state. However, this Bush project led to the Israeli aggression against Lebanon in 2006. And as we remember, there was a part of the Beirut, the capital Beirut, was completely destroyed. But Lebanon stood out with its resistance. So did Palestine. And then the so-called Arab Spring came on. And we know all, I mean, I don't have to tell you about what it brought of, uh, what of, of bloodshed and sharp division and defragmentation to our region. We know better because we live there. It's not because we know better than the others and resulting into causing human suffering and, and uh, millions of displaced people, whether it's internally in their country or externally, including Syria. All the way to Donald Trump. And with him came 
the deal of the century and the liquidation and the finishing of, or the kiss of death to the Palestinian cause with the policy of imposing maximum pressure on Iran and its allies in the region, including Syria, opposing the idea of the Middle Eastern Alliance as a political bloc that begins with the Abraham Accord, Abrahamic Accords. Uh, Trump and his team left, and here comes Joe Biden, and his team returned to carry two files, the security of Israel and the security of energy. What seems new is what the, I mean, the, the new thing, uh, if you, if, as you all know, that the King of Jordan announced uh, the, his interest in launching what is called a Middle Eastern NATO alliance or bar partnership with Israel. And here I quote the King of Jordan saying, the kingdom works actively with NATO. Uh, I will just uh, shorten the uh, quotation. I would be one of the first people that would endorse a Middle Eastern NATO. Just during the time the region prepare for Biden's visit, uh, many regional meetings are, uh, are being held in the preparation of the expected summit in Saudi Arabia, bashing all the promises of, Don, uh, of uh, Biden to isolate Saudi Arabia after the crime of Khashoggi, which we find weird. While indirect U.S.-Iranian talks are taking place in Doha, Qatar, and the Iraqi me mediation continues between Tehran and Riyadh. So are we heading toward an escalation or a truce. We're confused here. <laughs> what about the idea of this Arab NATO? And what are the goals of the, this promised alliance, which America later on, a day after the announcement of the King of Jordan, America came out and said, no, we're not planning to have any NATO alliance or Arab NATO, Arab alliance in the, uh, in the area. Uh, is it to count? I mean, is it to counter Iran, or is it to integrate Israel politically and security in its surroundings, and hand it, and hand the leadership of this Arab NATO uh, to this of this new bloc called Arab NATO? Is it, or are they? Um, they're not ready for any, or is America not ready for any kind of burden to be held in the? Uh, any kind of alliance burden to be held in the region. I mean, this is why we cannot, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, you fool me once, shame on you, but you fool me twice, shame on me. This is why we have what is called the axis of resistance. And although I have been presented as a member of the scientific research in the uh, Asham Pri Private University, I am also, I'm proud to represent what is called the international gathering in support of resistance uh, uh, in, in all of the world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me just, this is also a gentle reminder that the term axis of resistance appeared in the aftermath of George W. Bush 2002 State of the Union address in which he described Iraq, Iran, North Korea as axis of evil and their attempt to arm and threaten the peace and the world uh, and, and the credit goes here back to the Libyan newspaper called Al-Zahaf Al-Akhbar, the Green Marsh. This uh, uh, newspaper, in response to Bush's speech, speech, they said, or they wrote, the only common, the only common thing between Iran, Iraq, and North Korea is their resistance to the American hegemony. And here comes what is called the term uh, uh, axis of resistance, which, she, which, which, which soon became popular in the Iranian and certain Arab media, but it was only picked up in the West in the second half of the 2000s. Uh, during the Israeli wars in Lebanon, uh, Gaza, and their aggressive invasion to both areas. I would like to re reiterate the importance of what former um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Dr. Adrian, Professor Adrian, what he said that uh, his proposal about uh, creating more effective alliances that are based on mutual interests. And this is what the axis of resistance 
Afghanistan does. It's the most active tank functional alliances in the, in the region. The alliance known as the Axis of Resistance is held together, ladies and gentlemen, not by the religious identity or ideological, affin uh, ideological affinity as being promoted in the mass media or mainstream media, I'm sorry, mainstream media, West mainstream media. It is held together by mutual regional objectives and common rejection, re rejection of Western imperialism and Zionist pre-designs for the Middle East and the Arab region. With all due respect, with all due respect to the previous statement made by, by the respectful politicians and professors, Russia and Iran are support, supporting Syria for its key location, for its key importance. Syria is a key country in the region and has a very strong potential to become part of a major regional alliance in the region in the very, very near future. And after all this bad, painful experience with the American, no, Syria would choose the Axis of Resistance Alliance and it will stay there because they have the chance to become a part of major power in the region. And also, as I said earlier, America can never be trusted again. Neither, neither can Iran. Iran, they have a really bad experience with the American promises, like Donald one Trump. One minute. Yeah, actually, it's more than one minute. Yeah, more, more. Okay, one, thank one you. Minute and a half. Three minutes. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, as, as Dr. Kaba Maria said, four minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the rest. Uh, and this, this prosperous, uh, prosperous future for both of Syria, Iran, and Axis of Resistance uh, 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 allies, uh, this, all of this, it reversed the American desires. Actually, both of Syria and Iran are indispensable parts of the Axis of Resistance, and uh, they uh, have, like, they are the future of this region. Um, one more thing, I mean, the reason why Syria is going through what is being going, what, what is going through right now, actually, uh, let me just go through, and also with all due respect to Mr. Rahimi, uh, the concept uh, of democracy is very overrated, just like the concept of freedom fighter and the concept of, uh, uh, like, terrorism. The concept of democracy is overrated as Syria is, con is con I mean, Syria is being fought not because it's considered uh, uh, like an uh, authoritarian country as America and the West claims. Syria is uh, a democratic country for simple reasons. We have our system of ruling or our system of reigning is, has, has come from France. We have a seven years mandate for our president. Our president is re-elected every seven years. And these elections uh, were, uh, been, uh, were, have been, um, these elections have been surveyed, uh, supervised by international committees. We had an example of that, an example of that. We have tens of thousands of Syrians marching toward the Syrian embassy in Beirut. Uh, in spite of all uh, the resistance, or let's say the deterrence and the obstacles that have been put by Israeli-backed groups in Lebanon, yet they made it all the way to the Syrian embassy there. Uh, so let's agree that democracy is an overrated uh, uh, concept. The de American democracy cannot, like, be suitable for the Syrian democracy and vice versa. Uh, actually, unfortunately, I can't, I wanted to say more things, but I will just go to the final idea. I looked with the eye of envy. I looked with the eye of envy when my colleagues here were talking about how to engage uh, youth into track to diplomacy. And actually, in Syria, we have a severe lack, severe lack of the youth category during the 11 years of injustice war 
that we have been subjected to, the so-called regime changing war. And we cannot, I mean, while, while others have problems of engaging youth, we don't have youth in Syria. And that's due to the sanctions, the so-called sanctions, we call it unilateral coercive measures imposed by the American and the European Union on our country, in our country, that would prevent the youth from coming, coming back. We have refugees all around the world. We have uh, who are willing, most of them willing to come back to Syria, but they don't have the chance to because the sanctions or the coercive uh, uh, unilateral measures wouldn't uh, uh, give them any chance to think of coming back to their country. And do you know why? Because America does not want that. Because um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna say American is specific, but let's say the, the West, I mean the Israeli backing powers, uh, they don't want the wheel of recovery uh, of Syria to move fast. So they wouldn't, I, I'm not here to talk more about the uh, uh, sanction issue because my colleague, Dr. Rania, Rania Zreir have said enough about that. But the reason we're going through this is not because Syria is not a democratic country. We have American allies in the Arab region, KSA, Saudi Arabia. They are absolute anarchies. They don't even have a constitution. So it's not, we're not going through this in Syria because we're not democratic. It is because of two reasons. We are part of this axis of resistance because we have the potential of becoming a very prosperous, prosperous and strong country. Another reason is because of our uh, 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 economic, previous economic independent that we have. We are one of the countries that didn't have any money to owe, whether to the International Monetary Fund or to the Global Bank, World Bank. So this is why. One so, more thing. Uh, I, I ask you. One minute for, for Flavius, one minute. Okay. Flavius, one minute. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, um, this is all of it. So uh, uh, just, just, I mean, the, the, in order for us to think about what is called track two diplomacy, is first that we have to think about bringing the youth back to their country. And I think the world is in a front a very important humanitarian uh, test to help Syria bringing back its use here. The, uh, uh, the, in, the, in the Security Council, I mean, this is just the last anecdote. This is like a joke. The Security Council said that we can't bring our refugees back to Syria because uh, the situation in Syria is insecure. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two international organizations, UNHCR and UNRWA, and it's very well known to all of you. And it is, they are working and functioning really well inside of Syria, helping the refugees of both of Iraqi refugees and Palestinian refugees. How come I can host the refugees of other countries while I can't help my own uh, uh, citizens to come back to their homeland? It's just a simple question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your detailed presentation on the issues affecting Syria. And now I'll give the floor back to Flavius Cabo Maria to end the conference. And once again, I want to thank you for your endurance and for your patience with this event, which is now on its eighth edition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, this panel should be applauded because you have so many voices and different- uh, and strong voices. Young and strong voices. Now we are trying to conclude and maybe not more than five minutes to have the final thoughts, three minutes and a half. 
uh, we are starting with uh, the conclusion uh, from our partner for this event that we celebrate 120 years from establishing the bilateral relationship between Romania and Iran with His Excellency Ekbali Zark. Thank you very much. Again, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, of course, from the morning till now, we have had possibility to discuss a variety of uh, subjects from the north to south, from the east to west. And of course, the majority of people are referring to the Ukrainian crisis that really infected the affected all parts of the world, mainly Euroasia region. And uh, I think this crisis offer uh, good possibility of uh, enhancing uh, Iran and European cooperation, mainly with the 14 countries in uh, periphery of uh, Black Sea region. Because as you know, as and as they mentioned uh, many times today, uh, Iran have had very close and traditional and friendship relation with the country of this region. And because of that, today we are seeing to celebrate 120 years of uh, political uh, and diplomatic uh, relation between uh, Romania and Iran. Of course, as uh, my research and studies show our interaction and our relation go back uh, minimum to 2,300 years ago. Uh, and uh, this shows we have had a connection mainly in the some uh, important uh, and crucial time like in time of Ottoman, like in time of uh, 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 First World War and Second World War. And of course, always we have had very close relation with Romania uh, in time of communist and time of post-communist. And uh, I would like to congratulate uh, our Romanian friend that uh, last year and this year, our mutual economic exchange increased significant. And uh, I think we have enough motivation to increase our uh, mutual cooperation in all fields, in uh, science, in medicine, in education, in culture, in economy, political, and of course, one of the most important uh, recent of our cooperation on collaboration is in the research that MFAE uh, has played very important role and we hope the next session uh, to organize with MFAE and some other friends in Iran in IPIS in, uh, in the autumn this year. And uh, I think from today conference we are uh, uh, understanding, we are understand, uh, it is necessary to work on more dialogue and to have uh, a real knowledge on different crises because from morning till now we have received a various, mm -hmm. mm, uh, let's mm -hmm. say expression, opinion and approach regarding the some very That's simple cool. issue. What is Asia? What is the regional uh, division? What is the cooperation? What is the Middle East main or major problem? And that uh, shows uh, we are uh, in the uh, good stage of having close and uh, more efficient uh, dialogue in the uh, in the charge of uh, research institute think tank 
politic uh, personality. And one of important things that uh, uh, emphasized people was the necessity of uh, close cooperation between the academy and the politician. And of course, this year we have had a, a very important panel on the young and in the, uh, as they say, youth diplomacy. I think it is very important, and uh, they are uh, they have the possibility to uh, learn more and more and to achieve uh, from uh, experienced uh, researcher, diplomat, and other things. I think the time is so late. I should uh, stop here. Again, I would like to express my best wishes of health and uh, uh, security in your personal life and familiar life, actually. And as a Muslim, always we are in post the war, and uh, we are trying to pray uh, for peace and stability all around the world from Yemen to Ukraine and all other parts of the world. Thank you very much for your kind attention. We like less than one minute, uh, because exactly at nine o'clock uh, sharp, uh, we are finishing the this uh, marathon, roughly almost 12 hours, it's not 12 hours, but uh, less than a little bit. Uh, I would like to thank you very much because you stay here so long. We didn't expect it that our discussion is getting so deeply in analysis. We expected uh, uh, to have more, much more uh, comprehensive, but on the sake of the, the expression and the views from different parts from the region, we let all the things uh, to, to do on this way, each of them to express their own opinion, to be here from so long distance, to say more than five or 10 minutes, uh, that we offer this opportunity for all speakers to share with us uh, their own thoughts. I would like to thank you very much being here and to conclude the eighth international forum. And we hope next year, will be the nine, maybe we'll organize in October, not to have a, a summer, another challenge, maybe it's the vacation, but we'll think about based on our lesson learned from this year, to have it uh, an autumn when you have a starting a, a new as a new project. Thank you very much.